Today, we're gonna to answer the top 10 questions asked about infinite banking. This is part one of a two-part series. We're gonna review the top 20 questions that people ask us about infinite banking. So hopefully we get all your questions answered today. Let's jump into it. Hi everyone, I'm Darren Mitchell with Control and Compound. Joining me today is Christina Wyatt, Wealth Coach at Control and Compound Financial. Hi, Christina, how are you? Hey, Darren, I am doing awesome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited about this podcast. We get a bunch of feedback from clients and listeners about questions they want answered. So we're going to we're gonna dig into that today. Perfect. And before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that if you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, that you want to give us that five-star review um, and uh, subscribe. And if you're hitting or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you hit that like button and the bell button so you know when there's new content coming out. All right, let's let's jump into it, Christine. Let's see if we can we can fire off uh, some some answers to the most uh, most asked questions. So I want to start asking you a question. Question number one, probably the 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 one we get the most. What is infinite banking? Great question. That's a very popular question. Uh, infinite banking is a strategy, right? It's not a product. It is a strategy that we use to keep our money uninterrupted, so compound uninterrupted for life. And the way that we do that is we eliminate our wealth destroyers, like you talk about in Be The Bank, our wealth destroyers, which are taxes, fees, volatility, and spending. So the strategy is set out to eliminate those wealth destroyers so that we can keep our money compounding uninterrupted. Love it. Yeah. I mean, we, we could talk the whole podcast about what, what is infinite banking and, you know, we can leverage that money and buy other assets and multiply our money comes with a death benefit, credit protection, multiply your money, tax-free growth, all that stuff. But yeah, that that's it in a nutshell. Great, great response. Uh, what's next on our list? So another uh, very frequently asked question is how, how do I design an infinite banking policy? Because we do need to use uh, an insurance policy for this strategy. How does that get designed? Sure. And, and I mean, that's what we're experts at. But I mean, you know, we'll, we'll kind of tell you uh, a big picture w what it entails. I mean, you got to deal with someone that's an expert at this, first of all. Um, and then typically a policy is going to be an insurance product uh, um, that's going to be overfunded, which means we're going to put as much cash in there as CRA allows us to do. So at every age, at a 40 year old at 100 grand a death benefit, you can put in so much and then there's extra cash you can put in. So we, we call that overfunding. We want to make sure we're overfunded uh, as much as we can. What we're trying to do is drive down the insurance to as low as possible. So we have the lowest insurance costs. So we have the highest cash value. So overfunding, picking the right company, the right product, and the right advisor is the key, but it's it's a life insurance product that's overfunded to the maximum, uh, so we maximize the cash value so we can then leverage it. Exactly. If you don't see that overfunding, it is not an infinite banking policy. Like, huge, huge to know. The overfunding is very important to set these up properly. Great. Okay, question number three, Christino. What kind of life insurance do I use for an infinite banking policy or concept? So we have to use a participating whole life policy. Very important, participating. There are whole life policies out there. It is important that it is a participating whole life policy that is used because it's gonna give us um, the benefits that we need to structure this overfunded uh, insurance policy. It needs to be a participating whole life. Love it. Yeah, there's only a couple, couple participating whole life companies in Canada. One mutual, three participating that have a long track record. But yeah, great, uh, great there. What's next? How does the policy cash value grow? How is it growing? How does it grow? Yeah. So if you think of it, you get this big pot of money called participating whole life. And that could be 10, 20, 80 billion dollars uh, in that fund, depending upon that the, the company you, you, you work with. Premiums come in, goes into the fund. That fund gets invested, and they get invested in in great long term stuff. And we can we talk more in another podcast about what they actually invest in. That money gets invested, and then they pay death claims. But every year since 1846, for the oldest company, they've paid a dividend, and that dividend goes back to grow your cash value and your death benefit. They also make money a couple other ways. I won't get into too much, but you know, lapses is a big 
big money maker for insurance companies where people pay premium, cancel, get next to nothing back if the policy is designed poorly, uh, which happens a lot. Uh, well, that's a windfall for the insurance company, but it's a windfall for us because we own the participating in whole life fund. So when the participating policies windfall for us, all other policies windfall for the insurance companies. There's a bunch of tax stuff in there. Uh, Longevity is really improving uh, the returns on these funds too. But, you know, the fund gets invested, they pay death claims, and then every, every year these companies have always paid a dividend. Okay, Christina, let's jump to the next one. Should I build my policy for future deposits? What's, what's that mean and what's the answer to that? Yeah, so let's break that one down a little bit. Um, when we set these up, we set them up to maximize cash value, right? And in order to fit that or add that additional deposit, we need to purchase a death benefit. Death, um, the death benefit allows us that room um, that we can use to maximize the cash value in the policy. When we talk about, you know, adding additional deposits later, it's let's say if someone wanted to put $10,000 a year into a policy and they say, okay, well, in three years time, what if I want to put $50,000 into that policy? Can we set it up so I can put 10,000 for these three years and then put 50,000 in year three? Should you do that? Should you set your policy up to be able to do that? My answer to that is no. I don't think it's the most efficient for your cash values. And the reason for that is because if you want to put $50,000 in in three years, we need to purchase enough life insurance up front to give us that room available from CRA to be able to make that um, larger deposit. So what you're essentially doing is you're paying for more death benefit over those first three years that you might not be using. So can we do this? Yes. And if we know for sure that there is going to be a windfall maybe in the first couple years and we can structure it, but I myself think that the best way to do it is really to maximize those cat, those deposits every year and go straight to that maximum line. Cause that's going to really create those cash values for you. Um, and if you don't ever, you know, add that additional later on, um, you're going it, to, it's not, your cash values aren't going to be as efficient. It's just not going to work as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree on that. So, you know, if you had a, a lump sum in the first year or two and you want to throw a little extra in, we can build that in. But when you start talking three, four or five years down the road, you know, it's, it's let's put in the most uh, optimized plan to maximize your cash value. And then we can reevaluate, do another one, convert a term, all kinds of things down the road. You know, you can have as many, you, you can have lots of policies. So, so I agree with you on there. What's next on our list? Thanks for listening so far. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button so you always know when new content is coming out. If you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave a five-star rating and leave a review and subscribe. And if you are interested in learning more, please visit our website at controlandcompound.com to sign up for a free education session with one of our wealth coaches. So this is a, this is a good one. What if I don't need life insurance? If I don't need it? Don't need it. Well, I, I, I love this question. You know, um, you know, we, 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 we've helped clients buy a lot of policies through the years where people thought there was no need for insurance. This, this really comes down to a want. Um, people buy this oftentimes for a want, uh, what it can do. Can it grow your cash value tax free, help your retirement tax free, multiply your money, all the, all those in individual things. Um, but if you don't need insurance, I always ask people, do you want insurance? So I love asking the question, if insurance was free for the first $10 million of life insurance, would you sign up? And the answer is always yes. So, so they want it, but it comes down to a cost. And again, where we're focused on the cash value there, the cost, the cost is minor uh, for the death benefit. But if you don't need insurance, it's do you want all the other benefits of that? And, and really, when we start digging down with clients and, and the need for insurance, at the end, most of them come back to, wow, I actually do need some life insurance for income replacement, for taxes at death, for legacy, for helping my family to allow me to spend other assets, et cetera. Um, so, you know, when we boil it down, we don't see a lot of people not needing it. Uh, but even those people, they want it. Uh, you know, we have lots of wealthy people to put lots of money into this. They've got enough money to pay the tax. But if they can do it in a much more efficient way, allow access to their money in their lifetime, allow them to spend their own death benefit, it, it just makes sense. So always a want. Uh, we can have a debate whether it's always a need. 
Yeah, and I just want to add one other thing. I do. I've, I've talked to people and they're like, well, I don't need I don't need the life insurance. And I'm like, well, if we do it this way, CRA gets your money. And if we do it this way, your children get your money. So at the end of the day, you know, it, it just it's a better structure. You make the decision. But uh, I've never heard anybody saying, let's give it to CRA instead of our kids. So um, you might not need it, but it's going to work better for you in the long term. Right. Yeah, if someone came in and said, listen, we're going to take your bank account and we're going to make it 100 times better and tax-free growth, better growth, all these bells and whistles. Oh, and we're going to throw some life insurance death benefit on there for your family when you die. I don't think many of us would say no if we had all those improvements and we didn't, you know, it just it just makes sense uh, to do this strategy. The life insurance sometimes is a bonus and sometimes it's hugely valuable. So, you know, I don't want to discount the insurance that death benefit, we've we've both paid a lot of death benefits, and it's a it, it's a terrible time for the family. But we arrive with a tax free check when it's needed the most. So so there's there's so much value in that, and we've seen it firsthand. All right, let's jump to the next one. What if I am uh, what if I am uninsurable? So what is uninsurable, and what happens if you're uninsurable? So uninsurable means that you can't get approved for the life insurance. So we do need a life insurance product in order to do this. And every life insurance pro every life insurance policy has an insured. So there's an owner, there's a beneficiary, and there is an insured. They don't all have to be the same people. And a lot of the time they're not, but the insured body needs to be insurable. So they need to be able to um, pass medical um, medical questions. They have to be in good health at the end of the day, right? The insured needs to be in good health. So what happens if you want to be the owner of the policy, but you are not insurable, you can't get approved for that policy? we can change out the insured. So like I said, it doesn't need to, the owner and the insured do not need to be the same people. There does need to be an insurable interest. So a spouse is a perfect, you know, a perfect person. There's a reason why you would need life insurance on a spouse. If something happened to them, you'd need that death benefit. So you can actually insure them for the policy. Uh, if it's a corporate policy, a key person. So another shareholder is able to be the insured when it's owned by a corporation because they have an insurable interest so we can put the policy on them. So it doesn't necessarily need to be yourself as the insured to get one of these policies put in place. Yep, great response. Yep, I've got policies I own on myself, on my on my spouse, on my children. Uh, and again, I own all those policies, but you can be the insured and you can have a product on you and someone else, or if you can't get insured, you can put it on someone else, but you need that insurable interest. You can't can't pick a stranger on the street corner and say, "Hey, can I uh, borrow borrow your blood for a uh, for for an insurance test?" Uh, okay, what's next? Okay, so this is a good one. Is infinite banking only for rich people? Yes, only rich people. No, uh, <laughs> no, we we get this a lot, and you know we're we're a little different here at Control and Compound versus some in our industry. We don't think it's for everybody, right? Like um, we don't think this strategy is for everybody because. If, if you can't, you know, if you can't save enough money to contribute to this, um, may, maybe it's not the time to do, to do a policy. In other words, if you've got twenty or $30,000 of credit card debt at 25 or 30%, if you put your money in an insurance product and try to leverage that to pay off your credit card debt, you're not going to have access to 100% of your deposits in that first couple of years. So, you know, we're, we're, we're believers in get 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 that toxic debt taken care of build up a savings plan and then this is where you're going to you're going to put your savings for we multiply the money and do all that but certainly not for for just for rich people now do rich people use it yes basically people that are saving money can use this strategy so if you're not saving money if you're not able to save money every month or every year you need to get that in that in working order first does that make sense yeah, so you're definitely on your way. You don't have to be wealthy, but you have to be on your way to being wealthy in making those savings. Yeah. Well, you're going to want to be wealthy, right? Yes. You, you, you know, you're going to want to be able to build this opportunity fund that, that you can take advantage of, of opportunities when they come. And I think we're going to have tons of opportunities in the next couple of years. So, you know, I call it my opportunity fund. So if you're able to save and you want to build an opportunity fund with all the bells and whistles we've talked about, it's a great strategy. But if you're not able to save... Um, then take care of that toxic debt first, uh, and you know work with someone on a on a on a budget a, a, a budgeting plan, cash flow plan, etc. Okay, so that kind of leads into the next one, Christina. What amount of money do I 
need to get started? What's the minimum to start uh, an infinite banking policy? So we typically say that you should be saving, able to save into it at least $500 a month. $10,000 a year is great. $500 a month will work. Um, so you do want to be able to save that amount. If you, like we, you just said, if you can't save $500 a month, or if you're not already saving $500 a month, it's probably not going to work for you because it's, it's not the right time for you, right? You might need to be taking care of some of those toxic debts first, and then looking at saving into one of these um, policies. So that's really, that, that's where we say our minimum is. We definitely can take a look at, you know, what makes sense. If we're doing a children's policy, um, it might not be $500 a month. We can do lower for that. Uh, but typically that's where we say you should, you should be able to save $500 a month before you get started into one of these. Yep. Yeah, and that just kind of goes along with the, the last question is, you know, if you're not able to save money, if you haven't taken care of your toxic debts, it, it, it may not be, be the time to start and to start a policy at, you know, $50 a month or something. And then, you know, you're not going to build up enough cash value there to, to, to really uh, accomplish your goals. So get your savings in order. This is the place for savings, $500 minimum, usually 10 grand, sort of the minimum uh, we, we, we look at, but we're happy to do 500. Uh, okay. What are we on? Wait, one more to go. Yeah. The last one, um, is infinite banking a scam? No, it is not. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a scam. It's been around since 1846 in Canada. It's been, been, been going on for years. Billions of dollars go into this. Uh, we have a whole podcast, uh, where we, re, re, um, did a rebuttal to Dave Ramsey video. So check out that podcast. Uh, Infinite Banking is not a scam. This is where banks, wealthy people, business owners, real estate investors are, are, are putting their money. Uh, and this is where entrepreneurs, where, where investors, you know, it's, it's a huge mainstream uh, uh, industry that's been around as long as Canada and certainly not a scam. And we've got a hundred plus year track record to, uh, to prove that. Okay, Christina, those are the top 10 frequently asked questions. Uh, that's part one. There's going to be a part two coming up. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. If you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a five-star review and subscribe. And if you want more information, check out our website, controlandcompound.com, and you can sign up for an education session with one of our wealth coaches.